My name is Jerry Lynch. I'm the Donald Malore Department Chair of Civil and Environmental Engineering, and I'd like to welcome you to the University of Michigan's Building the Future Distinguished Lecture Series. I'd like to begin by first introducing what this Distinguished Lecture Series is about. In 2017, our department, the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, kicked off a strategic planning process. In 2019, we completed our strategic vision, which laid out for the field directions that we can take to essentially improve our society and our global community. The five strategic directions that were identified in our strategic vision include human habitat experience, shaping resource flows, adaptation, autonomy, and smart infrastructure finance. We're very excited about the vision that we put forth in each of the five strategic directions. We feel that it is the direction that our field and our profession needs to take to continue to have impact on bettering our world. This vision also reaffirms our value proposition to communities as we work in service to our society. The Building Future Lecture Series is all about highlighting our plan and driving discussion and dialogue around each of the five strategic directions. And today we'll be highlighting one of those strategic directions, the Smart Infrastructure Finance Direction. We hope that this discussion is going to build a broader community around each of these strategic directions that includes not only academics, but also industry professionals, educators, researchers, as well as students and the public. We aim to break down the traditional barriers that exist often between the lab and the field and accelerate our research into practice. Through presentations from leading experts and panel discussions after those leading experts have presented, we hope to bring new insights that this series will, uh, sorry, we hope to bring new insights and perspectives into each of the strategic directions that we highlight in each of our lectures. Now, in order to get to where we are today, it takes quite a bit of help. So I'd like to begin by first thanking our co-sponsors of this event, specifically the Environmental Consultant and Technology Company, ECT, the School for the Environment and Sustainability here at the University of Michigan, also known as SEAS, and Quantified Ventures. I'd also like to thank our Strategic Implementation Committee that's been led by Professor Sang Yun Lee. Today, Professor Peter Adrians, who's a professor here at the University of Michigan and the director of our Center for Smart Infrastructure Finance will be leading our discussion and introducing our speakers and panelists. So I'd like to thank Peter for his service today in guiding the discussion. Just a word about accessibility. We wanna make sure our event is accessible to all participants. This webinar will have automated captions and a transcript will be available. To choose a viewing option, essentially click live transcript on the control bar at the bottom of your screen where you can show or hide the subtitles or views, uh, the, few, the full transcript. So I'd like to turn it over now to my colleague, Peter Adrians, who will be introducing our lecturer as well as our panelists. Peter. Thank you, Jerry, uh, and happy Friday, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, today's uh, event, where we're gonna have a distinguished lecture on uh, emphasizing the strategic theme of smart infrastructure finance. Uh, but before we get started with all this, let's uh, give uh, provide a little overview by way of a video. Rebby. There's been a major transformation that's taken place in infrastructure. We've integrated all sorts of data capturing devices to actually measure the performance of the infrastructure. Smart infrastructure finance is a meta discipline that is taking advantage of the data that are produced from all these infrastructure systems and captures them into new financing models, very different from the ones that we've been using traditionally to finance our infrastructure. If you look at historically and currently how infrastructure is financed, everything is based on the tax base, the credit rating of the community that needs the infrastructure. What smart infrastructure finance does, it uncouples to some extent the financing of the infrastructure from the tax base that can pay for the infrastructure. The fact that we have data on infrastructure will allow us to actually better design and customize infrastructure systems based on the needs of specific communities. The engineer of the future will learn how to design infrastructure that is actually investable and can actually capture value for society and for the community.
Thanks, Ravi. So to give you a little bit of a background, uh, I want to remind uh, everyone that is uh, on the seminar um, on, on the site today to uh, uh, to send in all your questions. I mean, we've received some questions ahead of time, but send in your questions through the uh, chat room uh, and uh, sorry, through the, the Q&A function. And we'll get to as many of them as we can and live as well as those that get submitted uh, ahead of time. So now it is my pleasure to introduce both our distinguished speaker today, as well as our panelists. Um, we have, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, Professor Nusha Jami from Stanford University speak to us on a topic of harnessing the digital revolution to build the water sector of the future. Um, this presentation will be followed then afterwards by a panel discussion with uh, three panelists, uh, John Allen, Eric Letzinger, and uh, uh, Sanjeev Sinha. So Nusha is the Director of Urban Water Policy and Senior Research Scholar at Stanford Woods Institute of the Environment. John Allen is uh, local here, is an academic and, and research program officer at the School of Environment and Sustainability at U of M. Eric Letzinger, with whom I've collaborated for a number of years as well, is Chief Executive Officer at Quantified Ventures. And Sanjeev Sinha, one of my great colleagues over the last few years, is a senior vice president of environmental consulting and technology. So with this introduction, we'll come back to this panel after the seminar, but uh, let's invite uh, Nusha to present and speak to the theme of uh, digital infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's truly a pleasure to be here and I'm honored uh, to have this role of presenting to you today. Um, I'm going to actually talk a little bit about how the water sector is transitioning and what this transition really mean, means to us as uh, consumers and people who deal with this uh, uh, changing world. And as Peter mentioned in the video, um, it's really opening up a lot of new doors and it's just a matter of how we are going to harness those opportunities. Um, here I'm... Uh, going to sort of walk you through how we have been sort of dealing with this issue in the past century. Basically, we live in a world that is defined by the 19th century's laws and 20th century infrastructure and the 21st century challenges. Um, we uh, built this 21st century, 20th century water infrastructure model that was very much a very linear and once true system. And um, the way it worked was uh, we, um, you know, bring water from its source, there's a utility involved, it brings it to each individual household, um, then the water is collected, treated, and then put back to the environment for somebody else to pick it up and use it. And this worked really well for the past century. Um, basically, the principles that this model was built on was to enable growth and economic development. Um, it was very much of a sort of top-down engineering model and uh, to build large infrastructure and centralized assets, uh, deliver clean and potable water, manage wastewater and drain stormwater and flood water. And, and the reason I emphasize on those three is because we also put those in a specific box, as we said, people who bring water to us are in this box, they go figure out where to find water and where to, how to bring it to us. Then there was, there were another group that was involved in making sure that water is taken from our households and then um, uh, cleaned up and put back to the environment. And there was another group that was, in, uh, that was uh, tasked with dealing with flood management and stormwater management. And uh, they were sort of doing their own thing, building their own infrastructure. And there wasn't really much connection between these boxes. It was very much of a siloed system that was built. And as I said, it was a top-down governance model. People, as you see, they're not part of this process. They're not even um, taught, um, uh, you know, beyond being an end user of the system. And, um, this model, it, as I said, focused on a large in, uh, centralized infrastructure systems and uh, also assumed there's water abundance, there's enough water out there to go bring it to people, and we assumed hydrologic stationarity, there would be always enough rain and snow and uh, you know, uh, precipitation to uh, help us to manage these centralized systems. And then we assumed that people behave very um, uh, sort of 
similar and inflexible. They are always doing the same thing. They don't change their behavior. They are just uh, they are very inflexible and stationary. Stationary and um, and that actually um, worked, as I said, for most of the 20th century. But the water sector is really changing many challenges, uh, and a lot of them are challenges that um, sort of have been emerging in the past uh, 20, 30 years. Climate change is certainly is impacting the, um, the way our water cycle works, uh, increase uh, frequency and severity of extreme events. Think about uh, floods, wildfires, uh, droughts. Um, and, um, you know, there, there is a, um, uh, by, based on United Nations uh, estimate by 2050, about 70% of people are going to live in urban areas. So uh, increased density is going to be a thing and we need to pay attention to that. And population is also growing significantly. Um, Let's see. And then um, many of you have heard uh, we are dealing with a lot of aging infrastructure, but we built in the 20th century is reaching to the end of its design life. It's having a lot of issues, uh, main breaks, uh, in system inefficiencies, dams are having issues. Um, we are facing so many different challenges uh, uh, with these aging systems. And then also there are so many competing environmental needs and also stricter environmental regulations because we are realizing that we have to take care of our uh, water infrastructure and um, and sorry the water systems uh, and water and our uh, water bodies and that means that we are realizing that we need to be more specific and more uh, intentional about how, the way we manage our water the way the amount of water we live uh, we leave in the streams how we use the water, how we clean the water. So these stricter environmental laws and regulations are definitely impacting how much water we can take out of these um, and natural systems and how can how and in what shape we need to put it back. So, um, so this calls for this transition that we need to make to the 21st century infrastructure model. And that also, these challenges are also calling for fresh thinking. Um, this is, uh, Obviously, for those of you who have been in the water sector, nothing new. We have been talking about this distributed system for, for a while now, but they're actually popping up more often now than they, they used to be. Think about thinking about them similar to solar panels that people have on their roofs. 20 years ago, uh, not many people have solar panels on their roofs. Now it's becoming this um, uh, you know, sort of status quo in some parts of the country and needs new homes having uh, solar panels on their roofs. So think about this distributed water systems in a similar manner. You're still not there, but sort of gradually going there. And the idea of these distributed water systems, they can create flexibility so they can take pressure off our existing infrastructure model. They can, they can be more resilient because they are not as, as uh, sensitive to some of the climatic patterns we are experiencing. And that means that they can potentially create more reliability in our system. And also they can help us to diversify our water supplies portfolio. Currently, a lot of these communities that we live on, they depend on one or two sources of water um, for, uh, to meet demand. And as we introduce these distributed systems that uh, we are diversifying that portfolio, which means we can increase reliability. Um, things similar to water reuse, the stormwater capture and rainwater harvesting, um, uh, groundwater recharge and conjunctive use, conservation and efficiency, desalination, brackish water desalination, and uh, the list can go on and on. So when we think about the 21st century urban infrastructure model, that linear system we have, it's sort of changing into the circular model. Um, what does that mean? People, like there are buildings that are actually introducing recycled water as part of their system. We have um, cities that are building a centralized recycled water system to recycle their wastewater and add to their uh, water supply system. Uh, there's more rainwater capture that's being used and introduced to the system. As, I can, as, and as you can see these arrows, if I can find my own arrow actually on this, um, you can see that the arrows are narrowing and some of them are expanding just because we, the goal of this system is to take less from the nature, uh, to recycle more and to waste less. So it's much more um, dynamic. So this, uh, the, the idea of these systems, as I said, 
taking water from their existing system that we have, we are not going to get rid of our existing centralized infrastructure. We are going to still depend on those, but we are introducing this distributed systems in between. So it is sort of the start of disrupting this system and turning it into this hybrid model that has so many different dimensions and pieces uh, that needs to be managed in a coordinated way. And it's much more complex than what had we had before. So this 21st century water infrastructure model, as I said, is hybrid, gray to green, centralized to dis distributed. Um, and what does that mean is we need to actually rethink and revisit how we manage these systems together. Imagine if we had a linear system, we would have just a simple, simple way of thinking about it. We would have one model that would tell us how much water is in our reservoir. Then we would distribute it among our customers that actually use the same amount of water based on how many people live in their household. And then they would generate wastewater that would be treated and put back in the environment. Now, we have people, we have buildings that have recycled water which means that they're not using as much as they used to. We have people who are changing their behavior. We are not taking as much from our centralized system. So it's really changing the way water systems work. That means that we have to think, okay, would our management systems and decision support tools are going to work and how everything is evolving. And for making this transition happen, we have to sort of rely on a different kind of data platforms that we had, different information technology, different model, modeling platforms, and different sort of regulatory and permitting processes. So what do, what do we need to focus on as this transition is happening? I am going to focus on four things here because I think those are really in, instrumental elements of making this transition smooth and making sure we are not actually ending up in from a challenging system to another challenging system. So one is governance. So, um, you know, often when you talk about innovation, people really focus on technology. We would love to have new technologies to come and change the way we use water. But right now our challenge is not necessarily technology. We do have a lot of good technologies out there. They're just not having enough space to get into the system partly because our management approaches and governance system is very outdated. As I said earlier, it's top-down, uh, uh, linear, it's not really, it doesn't have a space for these new technologies. So uh, when you think about the 21st century urban water infrastructure model, it needs to be more data centric. We need to know how much more, how much water is coming into our uh, dams and reservoirs, which means that um, I'm not 100% sure why my, um, uh, that's okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, so um, think about the water source that I have. Unfortunately, my cursor is not showing up. So I'm going to point to things uh, with words and then hoping that you're following me. So imagine, we have, um, we, need, we have now satellite systems that can give us more information about uh, you know, atmospheric rivers and how much water is coming into our reservoir. Now we have communities that are generating recycled water. We need to have better data of how much water they're generating and how much they're using. We need to have better data about uh, individual customers, for example, industrial users. Now in the Bay Area, we have these major campuses uh, technology campuses that they have their own recycling plants. They are generating recycled water and they're taking less from our system. So it's sort of evolving. The utility is not the only actor anymore. We have customers that are basically becoming water producers and uh, Peter and I call them prosumers, which uh, some people don't like, but I think it's an awesome word because it sort of combines these producers and customers uh, uh, together putting them in the same category. And then, um, and this means that instead of utility being in the center of this process, actually data is in the center of this process. Every one of these customers and producers are generating water at the same time data that we can actually use to better understand how things are evolving, what is happening, where and how we are generating what. And, um, Another piece of this is demand is very much dynamic. So think about demand as when you think about water utilities, they think about demand as this linear process. As population grows, 
people use more water. Partly this was driven because we always assumed, assumed there's abundance of water out there to go and bring to people. Sometimes we did not even meter people to based on how much the water they use. Can you even imagine there's houses that they don't have any water meters? So we don't know what they do, when they do it, how they use their water, how their water use pattern is changing. So there have been sort of lack of this strategic uh, data gathering that was happening in the water sector. And um, often we assume um, it's driven by climate. So summer times people use more water than winter time. Um, it just depends on how much money people, people make. If they're wealthier, they probably use more water. And we assume that if, if we really want to change behavior, we just need to change the rates and people would change their behavior. And actually the reality is that is not how things are evolving. When you look at demand in the past um, 20, 30, 40 years, what we see is since the 1970s, uh, demand has been actually in many cities and major uh, population have been plateauing or actually declining, even though, um, um, uh, even though population has been growing. So for example, this is the, this is the water demand uh, for the city of Seattle. And what you see here is the black line is showing your water demand. Uh, this, this is showing how much water demand have been changing over time. And those dotted lines that you see is the projections of the city of Seattle on where the water demand was, is going to go. And you can see from the 1970s, every one of those projections have been over projecting how much demand is going to grow and over projecting how much water do they need. And what you see is as time has gone, now the projections are much more realistic. They're assuming that, okay, probably people are not going to use as much water and they're actually, they're, um, their line is sort of flattening a little bit and actually showing a more steady and uh, almost non-changing demand patterns, even though their population is growing. And this is not just a Seattle's issue. I'm just gonna show you. So, so these are like four different cities that uh, I put their water, project, water demand projections on the screen for you. But you can see that from DC to San Diego to Phoenix, even though the projections have been showing that water demand will grow for every one of these cities, water demand have been sort of um, steady and declining even though their population has been growing. So why does this really matter? Is because um, we really need water demand to understand what kind of infrastructure do we need? And if water demand is not just based on climate, demographic and economic, what is it based on? It's based on public awareness. It's based on the fact that people, humans change their behavior based on what kind of social or environmental stressors are based on, uh, there are, experiencing if it's a drought it's a, uh, any or a wildfire or a flood and another thing is people are putting all these uh, all these individual uh, households or actually uh, um, industrial customers are through generating their own recycled water so they are also changing demand patterns because if you think about it they are taking themselves off the water grid and becoming their own water producer so they are not putting as much demand on the system and when we are thinking about this, we have to actually, instead of focusing on only how, um, where water, sort of assuming demand is steady and um, uh, inflexible, we have to focus on diversity of demand and how all these different customers are changing their water demand and actually how much water is being generated by alternative water supply sources, for example, recycling or, or uh, stormwater capture. And that means that, again, if we want to better understand what kind of infrastructure do we need, we need to think about this diversity and change. And again, if demand is not growing, uh, if demand was growing based on what the utilities were thinking, we would have built much more dams, more major infrastructure, more conveyance systems. Um, however, as demand is not necessarily growing that way, we can actually focus on green infrastructure, uh, uh, potentially recycling, reuse, uh, uh, small, um, uh, uh, small systems that can capture and reuse water and on-site reuse and also conservation and efficiency. Now, if this is the case, if utilities are experiencing this 
change in demand, if their governance model is changing and their system is disrupting, why aren't they really adjusting? Their problem is they have a very rigid business model that is not really built for what they're experiencing right now. So think about scale. They are used to these large centralized systems, top-down model. They have to switch to small and distributed systems, which means a much more complex is changing their role as a utility. They're they not at the center, as I said before. They're becoming more of a coordinator rather than a central water generator. And um, also, they, the way that they set their rates was very different before. It was volumetric. We, they always assumed there would be people who would de depend on this water. So they had this volumetric water demand that um, the water rate processes that as you use more water, they, you would pay more. But if people are getting, going off the grid, if you and I are using less water, if the demand projections are showing demand is reducing, how are they going to survive? How are they going to operate and maintain their existing system? How are they going to deal with the cost of future infrastructure? They have to switch and change their rate setting process, which is actually a big problem because they actually don't have that, that model right now. They are, as I said, volumetric. They have to become much more better as, as the energy sector switch, much better at taking their rates and recovering the cost of their fixed infrastructure while using, while making sure they're charging people for what they're using. And, and this decoupling needs to happen, but they need, they need to have data and information to make that happen. And if, for example, they're not having good smart water meters, how are they going to decouple? If they don't know who is generating what, how are they going to decouple? How are they going to project how things are changing and look back and change their rate their race setting process? Another piece of this is the performance measures. Um, so imagine these utilities wanted to invest in this small infrastructure, such as green infrastructure, such as conservation and efficiency or uh, on-site reuse. What kind of performance measures do they need to put in place to make that happen? They used to have these performance measures that was, um, you know, I build 10 miles of pipeline, it will cost me this much, X amount of dollars, and it would deliver this much water. Now, if they are depending on nature or green infrastructure as an infrastructure, infrastructure system, they have to think, okay, how much uncertainty is in this system? How much water is going to be processed by this green infrastructure? Or how much efficiency and conservation am I going to experience? And how do I incorporate that in my uh, in the performance of my infrastructure? How, are, how is this on-site reuse system is going to disrupt the way I measure performance of my systems? So sort of going from this deterministic singular to multi-benefits. I'll give you a simple example for this. You know, we are switching a lot. You probably hear a lot more about green infrastructure and how uh, a lot of cities are trying to use um, uh, green infrastructure as a way of managing their stormwater and also recharging their groundwater and using stormwater as a source. As I said, it's not a certain system. It deals with nature and how nature behaves. And that means that it's much more complex. However, green infrastructure has a lot more benefits. It can help us with not only water quality and quantity, it can help us with air quality, transportation, um, health and transportation, like a more comfortable and easy transportation. Think about all this green infrastructure that sort of separates um, bike roads to bi bike lanes from uh, drivers. Um, it can help us with climate change and reducing emissions. It can provide some habitat and wildlife. So, so many different benefits, but how do you incorporate that when you as a water utility need to spend your dollars on water infrastructure? And that brings me to this concept of what is infrastructure anyway in this day and age? Um, you know, some of you have been following the uh, infrastructure bill that just passed, that, that has been just proposed by the administration. And there is a lot of discussion in that around what is infrastructure. And the reality is in this 21st century model that we have, infrastructure boundaries are blending and blaring into each other in so many different ways. Think about water supply, wastewater, and um, 
and stormwater. They are actually basically, um, as I am dealing, trying to capture stormwater to introduce it into my water supply, I see the boundaries of stormwater and water supply is blurring. And the same when I'm trying to reuse wastewater. So what you see is there's this wheel of colorful water, water that exists that doesn't have those boundaries that we set, which means that the boundaries are being redefined and they actually need to, we need to deal with this changing boundaries as we are looking forward into this 21st century transition and try to actually see what kind of information needs to be shared among those two, three silos that we have to help them to coordinate and collaborate across sectors. And that brings me to the final piece, which is about financing. Um, when I think about uh, blaring infrastructure boundaries, changing demand patterns, changing business model, the question becomes, what do you need to invest in and what kind of financial models do we need to make this transition happen? And while I'm not going to go into inf finance, financing infrastructure as a, a subject matter, I'm going to touch on something that's very important in this new world that we are dealing with. As we are seeing these blaring boundaries, changing business model, and changing demand, the importance of regional partnership and cooperation is becoming much more important. And that means that we have to actually diversify our water supply portfolios the way we diversify our um, financial assets. Uh, we are not investing anymore in one major dam to provide water to a city that depends on that that's population is growing. We are going to have much more diverse and centralized and decentralized system. That means that we have to find a way to reduce risk, to increase regional resiliency and increase access to capital. So think about that figure that I showed you with future infrastructure that is much more green rather than gray. Think about all those boxes from energy to transportation to, um, uh, to habitat to you know, uh, change in uh, health and well-being. All those have values. Everybody might be willing to put, a money, put money into this solution, but those actors are different from the water sector. So as we are thinking about this new infrastructure model, we have to think about where we can access those dollars and who is going to sit with us at the table and bring that water to us and bring that money to us and resource to us and how and where we need to share risk, who we need to share the risk with to make this transition happen. And that, again, goes back, back to what kind of data do we have? How do we measure? What kind of information do we need to make sure these blurring boundaries are informed in a, in a manner that can help us to better manage the systems, understand their benefits, and finance them in a better way? With that, I'm going to close with a few thoughts as we are sort of moving on to our panel. Uh, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to that. As we are thinking about this 21st century hybrid smart water infrastructure model, we have to think about when, where, how much. When, how we are, the when, where, how much is all about where do we generate water? When are we generating water? How much of that water is being generated? So the smart grid that can track distributed production and consumption patterns is key into this process, which means that we have to have better data and information. What is infrastructure? When we think about infrastructure, often just check yourself, you think about roads, uh, uh, you know, um, the transportation and um, you know, uh, electricity grids. Often people don't think about dams and um, pipelines, but there are also those that are out there. Those are hard physical infrastructure that we have that we often we invest on because it's easy, it's fancy. It is um, not fancy, but it's for the politician and decision makers. It's, uh, it's something that they can point to and say, look, we built this thing. But the reality is in this 21st century model, we need to focus on soft infrastructure, data, decision support tools, 
uh, infrastructure technology um, systems, smart meters, all these pieces that are central now into making sure we help this transition to happen and we can manage these where, when, and how much in a coordinated way. We can manage our centralized and decentralized system in a coordinated way. We can manage our gray and green infrastructure in a coordinated way. And we can invest in all those things in a coordinated way. What kind of performance measures do we need? We need to focus more, less on singular deterministic performance measures and focus on multi-benefits and cross-sectoral performance measures, which means that we bring more resources, we share risk, risk across sectors and access more uh, resources, money, and um, support and political buy-ins across the sector. What kind of business model do we need? We need to focus more less on this top-down model and more on circular data-driven and customer-centric. People are part of this process. Their data is informing this process. We are generating water in a circular manner. So we cannot have top-down volumetric rate setting process that's outdated and is actually hurting our systems. With that, I'm going to close, uh, close this. Um, I just wanna leave you with this quote, which I absolutely love uh, from Albert Einstein. It's, we cannot solve our problems by using the same kind of thinking we need used when we created them. And that's exactly what the water sector is dealing with. And that's exactly what should, we should not be doing of using the same thinking as we had in the 20th century. Thank you very much, uh, Nusha. Um, really appreciated the, uh, the overview of sort of the new thinking around uh, you know our infrastructure systems and going from you know, hard assets to digital assets so i want to now bring uh the uh panel um on the stage i guess is that how it's going to work so i want to have uh, john and eric and sanjeev i believe they're going to be on the gallery I think we're here right now. Okay. All right. So <laughs> let's let's, okay, we still have many more people here. I'm trying to figure out. I don't think we have the gallery yet. Okay. Um, so I want to start off with, you know, kind of questions and, and the devil's always in the execution, right? I mean, we're, <laughs> Going from a centralized system to a decentralized system, or going from a, uh, going towards some more data-driven system, or using data, I guess, to finance infrastructure uh, projects. I want to bring Eric on board. I mean, Eric Letzinger and Quantified Ventures definitely have been on the, uh, you know, definitely the leading edge of of uh, sort of rethinking uh, some of the financing models that actually do take data into accounts to start rethinking uh, new financing models. Uh, Eric, your initial reaction to to um, to Nusha's, uh, um, you know, points that she was making and how you actually executed on that in the context of quantified ventures. Sure, thanks, Peter and Nusha. That was great. Um, I, I feel like we could sit here through the weekend and talk about that. You put a lot out there, so thank you. I learned a lot. Um, listen, I think I think what we're all this data that that Nusha just talked about and all the smart infrastructure that's producing a lot of the data. It's just creating phenomenal opportunities for the public sector to pay for things in a different way. Uh, not only are they able to identify and understand risk differently. Uh, listen, since the dawn of time, we've been in the government. I say we in the government. I spent a third of my career running municipal agencies. Um, we pay for everything on the front end, and we kind of hope for the best, right? And um, and 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 we don't need to do that anymore. And, and for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, because we've got all this phenomenal data that can help us assess risk. What's purely innovative and nuts and what is business as usual, we've done it a million times. Like we're pretty good at assessing that and putting value and risk associated with that. And number two, there's a whole bunch of new classes of investor, impact investors, for example, who wanna get connected with the types of innovation that are gonna be needed to transform this industry. Um, and that, that source of capital, I'll just stick on impact investors for a second, they are willing to put their capital at risk 
if outcomes are achieved. Let's absorb that for a second because that's a big statement, right? Meaning it used to be, yes, I'll buy your bond based on your credit worthiness. Sure, you can burn my cash in the dumpster out back if you want. Like, I won't be mad at you as long as I get my coupon every six months, I'm good to go, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we're, this is a different cast of characters, right? Like, so they're saying, listen, I know I want you to innovate up this massive mountain that's in front of you, as opposed to, because you're not going to business as usual your way up that mountain. By the way, I'm talking to the public sector. Um, and, and, and we all know that, right? And you're not going to get up that mountain if you pay for everything on the front end, uh, because you can't choose innovation over business as usual. Um, so by creating financial structures for the government um, that enables them to um, attract new sources of capital like impact investors, and Nusha, one of, your, one of your final slides there was talking about the need to increase access to capital. Um, they want to be accessed. That's the good news, right? And they're willing to put their capital at risk if goodness happens. Think of that. Like that's what a great time to be alive. That's like a real thing. And by the way, there's lots of it. Um, so I think by creating transactions that enable the public sector to choose innovation over business as usual is a great way to unlock A, new sources of capital, B, address that second thing that Nusha was talking about, which is getting more resilience on the field, um, whether it's green infrastructure, whether it's upstream green infrastructure, you know, more nature-based solution. Nature reduces risk. She's great at it. Let's let her do it, right? And, um, and then that third thing uh, on your slide there, Nusha, about reducing risk um, by enabling these more outcome-based trans financial transactions to occur, um, we are inherently transferring the performance risk from the government off to the investor who's willing to and wants to shoulder that performance risk. So let, yeah, let, let's make that specific. And I want to draw uh, Sanjeev in uh, together with you. I know both of you are collaborating, uh, working together on a, a new major infrastructure project, a stormwater infrastructure project. I believe it's in Buffalo, New York. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Bringing in major, I mean, sort of your your stalwart investors, right? I mean, I think is it JP Morgan or Morgan Stanley? I forgot which one. I always mix the two of them up. But you're bringing in major investment banks, right, into projects like that. Sanjeev, can you talk sort of drill it down a little bit to the to the to the execution? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, over the last five years, there are several classes of investments that have emerged that are very much focused on performance-based uh, work that we were discussing. By the way, before I begin, I really should underscore what Eric said earlier, Nusha, your talk was just fantastic. I took a lot of notes. I wasn't joking, look at that. Actually, you can't see, it's blurred. <laughs> blurred background, so you cannot see that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> from my standpoint, the, you know, the setup of municipal bonds has been around in, in the US for more than 150 years. So from there, there was a movement to go one step further and it became a little bit more about intent, namely the green bonds. Uh, green bonds are really flourishing. Those of you that are students and have time or that are not students and have time, uh, you really should consider listening to Peter's upcoming webinar because he's an expert on the topic and it's really a pleasure to actually hear all the changes that are happening. And then you have the third class of investments that are the environmental impact bonds, where you are also connecting with the performance as opposed to just declaring the intent of what you're trying to do. Eric is in, uh, Eric's work is in that category. Uh, in <clears throat> uh, Buffalo, for Buffalo Sewer Authority, uh, you know, they connected with our project team, which comprised of ECT quantified ventures. Uh, and uh, we are in the process of uh, doing the you know, bond release after working on it for almost a year, uh, developing all sorts of performance metrics. Uh, their primary out output metric is actually the aerial extent of the you know, number of acres of green infrastructure that will be built over the next five years. Uh, but it's in hundreds of acres. And, uh, and what's the, the size of the bond? What's the size of the bond just to give people a sense it's, that it's not it's just about a... 55 million as right. of last right. count, although that keeps changing depending on several things are in play right now. So actually we started from 30 million and now it's at 55 million. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we are heading in the right direction. And it's a, you know, it's interesting. I will tell you that from an environmental impact bond standpoint, just one specific class of investments 
four EIBs in the country. Eric has led all of them. Uh, you know, thus far, maybe about $55 million worth of investments across the country. The fifth one will be the same as all four combined. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, I will be, a, you know, remiss if I do not also articulate the aspect of public private partnerships or community-based programs that we are also engaging in in Milwaukee, for example, a $20 million transaction there. Um, and, uh, you know, that also started in 2016. And right now there are $700 million worth of the stormwater infrastructure projects, all of which have some measure of performance-based contracting goals within them. Uh, so it's very exciting development. Uh, and I think it's awesome that you're hosting a topic on something that is emerging as we speak. So even broadening out from the different asset classes, uh, I mean, it, it really all ties into what Nusha was talking about, right? All these new sort of decentralized models and conservation models and participation by citizens and whatnot. So bringing John in, uh, John and I have been going to a conservation finance workshop for the last five years with Credit Suisse. And uh, I think uh, two, two years ago, so we got this major brainstorm on conditioning capital right, for sustainability. Uh, and uh, that, that really sort of applies not just in environmental impact bonds, but in all kinds of money, right? As Nusha is talking about data, data generate opportunities for money. Right, so um, John, can you talk a little bit about you know conditioning capital for sustainability? What we mean with that, and how that applies in this context? Yeah, I think that's 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 a good segment of this conversation. I, I do want to sort of Nusha, thank you. That was as I I also took tons of notes, and we could spend hours just sort of unpacking elements of that. So that's been fantastic. I, I also want to remind everybody that we are talking about financing. We're not talking about funding and there's a real difference financing still seeks a rate of return how we condition that rate of return who is asking for the rate of return what that rate of return is pegged to what kind of investor that is you know whether whether you know and the expected interest rate on that return we're still talking about financing and financing does have contrib contributory to it a rate of return I, I give money for a project i want something back for that I also want to, and what we're talking about is what are the conditions around that flow of money that not only say I want a, a return, whatever that return is, but I want to know that that money is doing what I expect it to do, to Eric's point. Well, how is it, how are we conditioning the performance? So when, when we talk about this, we're, we're saying that there's now actually trillions of dollars, not just millions of dollars or billions of dollars, but trillions of dollars that are now acting in the markets and whether that's on the green bond or the impact bond side, but we also see it very prominently in, in lending on the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the lending side, the green lending side, that if I wanna to lend to you and I want you to return that money, I also wanna know what you're doing that both reduces my risk and augments my expectations for social performance. So Peter and I have been working a little bit in the agricultural space. So we have two models of, of conditioning nit nitrogen and phosphorus performance on the farm field. Well, three really, one is to tell the farmers they can't do it, right, regulatory. Another is what I like to call the door knocking approach. You knock on enough farmers doors and say, I will pay you not to do that with a farm payment or a structure, buffer strips. The third is to say, if you wanna participate in the supply chain, if you want to sell grain to me or further down the road, if you want to, if I want to aggregate grain to, to make, you know, post toasties or Wheaties or whatever, or right or whatever, whatever I'm making, then I need you to attribute that performance, right? If that money is coming into the financial from the financial markets with an expectation, how is it running through the entire supply chain? Not just as a condition of my relationship bilaterally with you, but how are you influencing it across the entire supply chain? Does that money actually flow back expectation flow back all the way to the farm field saying, if you want to sell grain into that market, you will now show that you're not causing harm, either nutrients or phosphorus, you're not causing a green lake Erie, whatever that is. We think this conditioning of capital is a profound influence, not just bilaterally, but multilaterally through the as it ramifies through the supply chain. Uh, great, thanks, John. Actually, I want to bring in that back to 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 Nusha also because we're really talking about data, conditioning of capital, understanding use, and Nusha, of course, because I'm aware of uh, quite a bit of your research. 
uh, you have this 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 uh, one project I guess you've been working on with uh, one of your students or multiple of your students where you're actually tying data from utilities to uh, information that you're getting from new kinds of data platforms. You were highlighting a couple of data platforms such as Zillow, right? I mean, one of the questions that we have online here is what kind of data are being generated? Who uses it? What do you use it for? So can can you walk us sort of quickly, <laughs> virtually here through this, uh, you know, this this link from, from uh, the utility and the policy all the way down to the end user and how one understands the end user and how that potentially informs, you know, decisions that are being made for water utilities. Absolutely. I think um, just to give you a quick sense of why we did that, why we use that data, we are very interested in what people do in my team, because what people do ultimately defines how their behavior changes. And it's a little bit different from when people say, tell you they want to be sustainable. It's just more like, this is more, um, uh, sort of passive way of telling you what they would do, just using that kind of information can give you that, uh, get that capacity to measure. For example, with Zillow data, we wanted to see how urban form is changing people's water use. Um, and we actually worked with Zillow, got their, da got their data, and went to through tons of data processing. Obviously, that's another challenge. You have a lot of data. How do you combine these data sets and how do you make sure they're talking to each other, right? When you're talking about the performance measures, the same issue comes about. Um, so we sort of figured out how, um, how combine these data sets and then eventually understand, okay, so as, as these cities are developing, and building new homes, new buildings, new uh, sort of changing their land use, what kind of land use really feeding into this sustainable future? And do we really, can we really predict how the future is going to look like considering this kind of new data form that's out there? And what we actually also found was income doesn't matter anymore because the wealthy people are going to buy that efficient home that has a smaller backyard just, and they are going to use less water just because they're much more involved, they're much more thoughtful. They actually depend on um, you know, centralized systems as a, as a way of using water. For example, they, they're happy to have a um, you know, smaller backyard by a, by a shared green space in their community. Right? So this transition is very much clear in this process. Now, if I'm a water utility and I'm not understanding how this urban forward and land use change is impacting my water use in the future, I'm going actually to invest in things that they don't really going to pay off. And that means that my cash is trapped into these major projects that I'm not, I'm not going to be able to take them out or invest in anything else. And that's where you're gonna have a risk problem, you're gonna have sustainability problem, you're gonna have actually a lack of transition. And at the end of the day, lack of proper income. Because if I'm not recovering that revenue, if I'm not recovering from, the, from um, my investment, ultimately I have no dollar to spend in anything else. So I, that's why we have spent a lot of time in my group to sort of try to understand how this demand pattern change needs to be better sort of done, inform, like uh, predicted, and how can it be used to inform these utilities as they're thinking about investment? Because often, and I'm sure all, all of you can, um, you know, have that, had this experience, when you sit at a table with the utilities, um, especially on the, you know, top the sort of managerial level, their mindset is always, where, I do, where do I need to invest my money? And definitely it's probably a dam or a, a major wastewater treatment plant or major something is at the table. And it's never these smaller solutions that can sort of marginally improve the system and help it to move forward. So uh, I wanna, because again, I wanna be mindful of time too, these 20 minutes go very quickly here. I wanna sort of ask you, put a question out sort of the, the one minute sort of to, to the four panelists, to the three panelists, well, I guess the four panelists, three panelists and the speaker, uh, 
on, you know, as, as infrastructure goes digital, which was really the topic of water infrastructure goes digital, which was really the topic of your presentation. Do we see an opportunity in the future for a data market where people are going to be willing to pay for performance data in one way or another, whether it's through an outcomes-based financing model or even through a data licensing model? I just wanted to sort of get a sense, you know, reaction, futuring reaction, uh, one minute each. Uh, what do you think about the future opportunity for data markets? Uh, in this whole sustainable water and other space. Well, let me let me start. Take a quick shot. I, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, there are companies coming up right now that are looking along the entirety of the water supply chain, but from supply all the way through back, you know, from nature to nature. Many ways to look at that. But remember, one of the biggest ways that we, one of the biggest costs of energy in this country, singularly, is the movement of water. We used to talk about this relative to uh, relative to in, sort of in, in investment capacity or headroom, we called it. You know, if we can find ways to, to shave out 5, 10, 15, 20 percent of the energy costs of moving water, the much more thoughtful use, which is a data play in many ways, not exclusively, many ways. That actually allows local utilities the investment headroom to invest in additional infrastructure, smart infrastructure, green infrastructure, without actually continuing to go back to the rate base, without back to the customers. So we want to make a cycle where the inherent capacity of the utility and others to increase their efficiencies actually helps start to service the debt on things like finance. And I think that's, that's an important cycle, but I think that's critical where data plays a strong voice and will continue to play a voice. A lot Sanjeev. more there, but that's, I'll stop there. <laughs> Sanjeev, data markets in the future? I think the answer definitely is yes. In fact, I would say that it is already happening. You know, uh, many of the uh, entities that we work with, uh, again, Quantified Ventures is a great example of that. Their entire business model is really centered on being able to procure more data. I would, I, I would say though that, you know, what Nusha present, presented today is very exciting, but she's truly giving you a futuristic view of how the planet will be in year 2050. I think, you know, when guys like me approach the a vast, vast majority of municipal players, they don't really understand what is it that we are trying to sell. There is a reason why after five years, we have five CBPs and four EIPs. It's not easy. Not 500, um, which we should have. <laughs> exactly. I do think the market is gaining traction, and I think it will continue to be uh, heading in that direction. The question that Glenn asked is a key one, which is whose data are you asking? So you really need to know which subsector of water infrastructure you are really discussing and where it is. So in urban areas, perhaps there is more of a need. In rural areas, right now, it is a little bit of a harder sell uh, from my standpoint. I will, one, uh, you know, final item that I leave it at uh, for you guys is, first of all, there is an excellent book that came out, uh, which is Making Money Moral by uh, Judy Throdian and Sadia Matsberg. You should consider reading if you're a student. I think you will find it very educational. So I give it back to you because I know we're running out of time. Great. <clears throat> Eric, you cracked the... Uh... You cracked the door in the big financial institutions with uh, yeah. data-driven financing. <laughs> I'm with Sanjeev. I, I, I feel like we're already headed down that path. And I would say the reason, first of all, we have to do that. That, that, that is a must if we're all going to get up that mountain, right? And, and, and here's the other reason I think it's going to happen because, listen, we have the luxury of working with, you know, rock stars like Sanjeev and, and, and his colleagues at ECT or Artemis Pyle and Brenda McLaughlin at Woodard and Curran, right? Like these are, these are people who are very much thinking about not just where we are today, but where we need to get to and, and thinking backwards from that and, and taking, you know, as Sanjeev says, you know, small steps, like there's no, there's no pass plays in water. Everything is smash mouth football three yards at a time, right? <laughs> and uh, but I think I think those that are very much in that one at a time and trying to move up that mountain very much have that data mart that you're talking about in mind, and uh, we're going to get there. Nusha is the future environmental engineer, a data scientist. I, I absolutely think it is, but I, I think one thing that Sanjeev and Eric said that. It, plays more into what you guys are doing at the University of Michigan is there's so much opportunity in this process of transitioning 
to do research and understand how this transition needs to happen. And right now the field, one of the reasons, obviously one reason that we are not transitioning is our outdated business model and very sort of risk averse behavior that these utilities have. And that's definitely on play, but also lack of understanding. We are not spending enough time to see how this transition needs to work. How do you measure performance? What do you do to build a futuristic uh, infrastructure model depending on data. And uh, I think as we are sort of learning more, I think universities have an opportunity to play a more major role in this process of transitioning and informing this process.